Some of the illusions I'll be playing need to be heard through stereo headphones or stereo loudspeakers. So here are two sound patterns to enable you to test your equipment. This sound is coming from the speaker or earphone on the right. This sound is coming from the speaker or earphone on the left. When you first view this picture, it appears as a jumble of meaningless blobs. But when I tell you that it's a photo of a spotted dog against a dappled background, the ears emerge, the nose, the legs, and so on, and the picture gradually assumes a meaning. Our stored knowledge of thousands of dogs we've seen in the past enables us to reconstruct this image correctly. And when you view the same picture again, even weeks or months later, it will probably make sense to you immediately, since your visual system will now be organizing its components based on your earlier experience. So this picture illustrates the power of unconscious inference or top-down processing on visual perception. But this influence is perhaps even more important in our perception of music. Here's an illusion that I created called the scale illusion. It shows that our knowledge and expectations about sound cause us to create patterns in our minds that are not really there. The sequence that's presented is shown in the upper part of a slide, and the sequence in the middle part shows an alternative representation of the same thing. As you can see, the pattern consists of a scale with successive tones alternating from ear to ear. The scale is played simultaneously in both ascending and descending form, such that when a tone from the ascending scale is in one ear, a tone from the descending scale is in the other ear. When the sequence is played repeatedly through stereo headphones, it's very rare for anyone to hear it correctly. The type of illusion varies from one person to another, but the most common one is shown in the lower part of this slide. The correct sequence of pitches is heard, but as two separate melodies, a higher one and a lower one, that move in opposite directions. And for most right-handers, the higher tones all appear to be coming from the right earphone, and the lower tones from the left one. When the earphone positions are reversed, the perceived locations of the higher and lower tones often remain fixed. This creates the unsettling impression that the earphone that had been producing the higher tones is now producing the lower tones, and that the earphone that had been producing the lower tones is now producing the higher tones. Here's the pattern in stereo. Now here's one channel alone. And here's the other channel alone. And here are the two channels in stereo again. So why should we experience the scale illusion? Our everyday world of sound is an orderly one, and our hearing mechanism, taking advantage of this orderliness, has developed assumptions about what sound patterns are likely to occur. So when this pattern is played, we reject the correct, though improbable, conclusion 
the two sources are each producing tones that leap around in pitch. Rather, we assume that tones in one pitch range are coming from one source and tones in a different pitch range are coming from a different source. So we perceptually reorganize the tones in accordance with this interpretation, even though this causes us to experience an illusion. Here's a related example from vision. This is a picture of a hollow mask taken from the inside. Although the different features, such as the nose, are projecting inward, we perceive them as projecting outward. Our knowledge and experience that faces project outward cause us to view this picture quite incorrectly. The scale illusion has another surprising aspect. Most, though not all, right-handers hear the higher melody as coming to the right ear and the lower melody as coming to the left ear. On the other hand, left-handers are more varied in where the higher and lower tones appear to be coming from. Now, in most right-handers, the left hemisphere is dominant for speech and is primarily involved in perceiving sounds from the right side of space. But the left hemisphere is dominant in only about two-thirds of left-handers, the remaining one-third being right hemisphere dominant. So this illusion illustrates striking differences between listeners in how even simple sound patterns are perceived. Since these differences correlate with handedness, they're most likely to be innate in origin. Variants of the scale illusion are easily produced. For example, here's a two-octave chromatic scale which alternates from ear to ear in the same fashion. Here it is in stereo. Now here's one channel alone. Now here's the other channel alone. And here are the two channels together in stereo again. We can then ask, are these illusions simply laboratory curiosities in which the brain is made to come to the wrong conclusions under very unusual circumstances? Or do they also occur when we listen to music in the real world? I found that the scale illusion appears strongly when the sounds are produced by live instruments in concert halls. An example occurs at the start of the last movement of Tchaikovsky's Sixth Symphony, the Patetique. As shown in the upper portion of the slide, the first violins play one jagged sequence, while the second violins play a different and overlapping jagged sequence. I should add that in Tchaikovsky's time, the first violins were to the left of the orchestra and the second violins to the right, so they were clearly separated in space. Presumably, Tchaikovsky expected the theme and accompaniment to be heard with the tones wafting back and forth across the stage. But the theme is heard as coming from one set of instruments and the accompaniment as from the other. Here's a video taken from a 1989 episode of the PBS series Nova, entitled What is Music? It shows the UCSD Symphony Orchestra conducted by Tom Nee. The orchestra is arranged in 19th century fashion, with the first violins to the left of the audience and the second violins to the right. The first violins play their part alone, then the second violins, 
And finally, both parts are played together. This video is in mono, but one experiences the same thing when listening to the passage in a concert hall. We are reorganizing this orchestra so we can hear a remarkable example of this effect. The musicians who play the second violin part are moving to their 19th century position on the right. The passage will be from Tchaikovsky's Sixth Symphony, written when orchestras were arranged this way. With the second violins now on the right, the first violin section remains on the left. This is the first violin part. It's intended to go with this second violin part. Now, together, something new emerges. Just as in the lab experiment, our brains hear a melody that no instrument is playing. Now here's the piece in its full musical context. It's a perfect example of the complexities that appear when you try to analyze how music and mind interact. In fact, this illusion may have been the cause of a serious disagreement between Tchaikovsky and the conductor Arte Nikish. In the summer of 1893, Nikish met with Tchaikovsky to discuss his newly composed symphony, which was due to be premiered shortly thereafter. As the story goes, Nikish wanted to have this passage rescored so that one violin part would play the theme and the other part would play the accompaniment. But Tchaikovsky refused to change his scoring, and the symphony was premiered as originally written. No one knows why these two great musicians disagreed with each other so strongly, and there's no evidence that either of them realized that they were dealing with an illusion. Some people have speculated that Nikish was concerned to extract the best performance from the orchestra. His rescored version is easier to play and that Tchaikovsky, on the other hand, was determined that the audience should hear the notes of the theme waft back and forth across the stage. But there's no doubt that this passage produces an illusion. The theme is heard as coming from one set of instruments and the accompaniment as from the other. In fact, we don't need either computer-produced sounds or trained orchestral musicians to produce the scale illusion. Walt Boye, who teaches music at the Atwater Elementary School in Shorewood, Wisconsin, produced this video showing two fifth graders playing it on xylophones. Okay, so here we are. We're back here at our second class, and we've, we're going to do this crossing melody experiment, but instead of having everybody do it, we're going to have two individuals play it one at a time and see if the class can hear it. So we have Jimmy and Josh. Jimmy's at one alto and Josh is at the other. We're going to have Jimmy play the, let's see, what color? Jimmy's going to do the blue melody, right, Jimmy? Mm -hmm. You're going to do it four times, then Josh will do the red melody four times, and then we'll see what it sounds like when we combine them both together. Okay, audience members, please be quiet. All right, Jimmy, one, two, ready, go. <laughs> Good. Let's keep up those hesitations, all right? All right, Josh, did you play the red melody four times by yourself? Ready? Two, three, go. Good. Now, listen carefully, everybody. Over there. Gentlemen, try playing them together four times through. 
concentrate on your pattern, not the sound. One, two, three, and four. Stop. Did you hear it? turn around right where you are look at those colored melodies here's my question Shh. looking at this stuff over here can someone just keep an eye on this look at those melodies and try to tell me what do you think is going on in our brain that's creating these two Here's another example from vision showing the influence of experience and expectations on our perception this is a picture of the Helix Nebula taken from the Hubble telescope. It looks just like an eye, but in reality its span is roughly two and a half light years and it lies about 650 light years away from us. Similarly, when we listen to speech, we draw on an enormous amount of experience to make inspired guesses as to what's being said. But this very process of guesswork can lead us to perceive words and phrases that are not in fact being spoken. For example, there are Mondegreens, which were popularized by John Carroll in the San Francisco Chronicle. A well-known example is Gladly My Cross-Eyed Bear, which is from the famous hymn Gladly My Cross-Eyed Bear. Another example is I Led the Pigeons to the Flag, a mishearing of, I pledge allegiance to the flag. Some years ago, I discovered a way to produce a large number of phantom words in a short space of time. You sit in front of two loudspeakers, with one to your left and the other to your right. A sequence is played that consists of two words, or a single word that's composed of two syllables, and these are repeated continuously. The same sequence is presented from both loudspeakers, but the sounds are offset in time so that when one sound, that is word or syllable, is coming from the speaker on your left, the other sound is coming from the speaker on your right. Because the signals are mixed in the air before they reach your ears, you're given a palette of sounds from which to choose, and so you can create in your mind many different combinations of sounds. On listening to one of these sequences, people often begin by hearing a jumble of meaningless sounds. But after a while, distinct words and phrases emerge. Those from the speaker on the right often appear different from those from the speaker on the left. Then later, different words and phrases emerge. And in addition, people often hear a third stream of words or phrases apparently coming from some location between the two loudspeakers. Nonsense words and musical sounds sometimes appear to be mixed in with the meaningful words that are heard. People often report hearing speech in strange or foreign accents. Presumably they're perceptually organizing the sounds they hear into phrases that are meaningful to them, even though they appear to be distorted in consequence. And people for whom English is their second language often hear words in their first language. So they've reported hearing words in Mandarin, Cantonese, Korean, Tagalog, Spanish, French, German, Hebrew, and Russian, to name some. Also, people often hear words and phrases that reflect what's on their minds. For example, people who are on a diet hear phrases like Diet Coke and I'm Hungry. And when I've played these phantom words to classes near exam week, they often report words like No Brain and I'm Tired. Here are some reports from students in a class that I teach at UCSD when they were presented continuously with the word Nowhere. Window, Welcome, Love Me, Run Away, No Brain, Rainbow, Raincoat, Bueno, nombre, bueno when, mango, window pane, Broadway, Reno, melting, Rogaine. 
To give you a sense of the effect, here are two examples. And I suggest that you not wear headphones for these, but rather hear them through stereo loudspeakers. played seven phantom word sequences informally to my class of graduate students and they wrote down on a whiteboard what they heard. The result is shown here. In a recent experiment, together with Kevin Julie and Trevor Henthorne, we presented subjects with seven such phantom word sequences. Now it's been shown that right-handers tend to perceive verbal materials better when they come from their right rather than their left. So we surmise that the right-handers might hear more phantom words and phrases coming from their right and that the non-right-handers wouldn't show this difference in perceived location. The subject's handedness was determined using the questionnaire shown here. They were designated as right-handed if they circled nine or ten rights on the questionnaire and as non-right-handed if they circled seven or fewer rights. To ensure that any effect of spatial location couldn't be attributed to a difference in loudspeaker characteristics, 
The right-handers and non-right-handers were each divided into two groups, so that half were facing forward, that is, toward the speakers, and half were facing backward, that is, away from the speakers. The subjects wrote down each new word or phrase when they heard it, and they indicated whether it appeared to be coming from the speaker on their left or on their right, or from somewhere between the speakers. We tabulated the average number of phantom words that were reported as coming from the left, the right, or the centre. With the forward-facing subjects, the right-handers heard, statistically, more phantom words as coming from their right than from their left. But the non-right-handers showed no difference in the directions from which the phantom words appeared to be coming. This slide shows the same thing for the backward-facing subjects. The right-handers again heard more phantom words as coming from their right than their left, and the non-right-handers again showed no difference in the directions from which the phantom words appeared to be coming. So this experiment confirmed our surmise that right-handers would tend to hear more phantom words as coming from the right side of space but that this wouldn't be true of non-right-handers. And this implies that the dominant hemisphere is more involved in constructing meaning from ambiguous speech sounds. So finally, I'd like to go into the relationship between speech and music by examining the mysterious no-man's land between the two and showing how fragile the boundary between them can be. Composers throughout the ages have played with relationships between speech and music, either by composing music that has some of the qualities of speech, or by embedding short segments of speech in musical contexts. In particular, the composer Mussorgsky argued that music and speech are in essence so similar that with practice, a composer could even reproduce a conversation in music. As he wrote in a letter to Rimsky korsakov Whatever speech I hear, no matter who is speaking, my brain immediately sets to working out a musical exposition for this speech. But can speech be made to be heard literally as sung rather than spoken? An incident occurred when I was fine-tuning the spoken commentary on my CD, Musical Illusions and Paradoxes. To detect flaws in my recorded speech, I was looping phrases so that I could hear them several times over. Suddenly it appeared to me that a strange woman had entered the room and was singing. Rather alarmed, I looked around and finding that I was still alone, realized that I was hearing my own voice as sung rather than spoken. So the simple process of repetition had caused my voice to morph perceptually from speech to song. Here's the full sentence, followed by the phrase presented repeatedly. The sounds as they appear to you are not only different from those that are really present, but they sometimes behave so strangely as to seem quite impossible. But they sometimes behave so strangely, they sometimes behave so strangely, 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 so strangely, so strangely, so strangely, so strangely. So it sounds like this. Now listen to the full sentence again, and this is exactly the same as the one you first heard. You might find that it begins by sounding like normal speech, just as before. But when you come to the phrase that had earlier been repeated, I appear to burst into song. The sounds as they appear to you are not only different from those that are really present, but they sometimes behave so strangely as to seem quite impossible. 
And once you've heard this phrase a song, you continue to hear it a song, even after months or even years have elapsed. So the speech-to-song illusion provides an example of very rapid and yet very long-lasting neural plasticity. This transformation doesn't only occur in adults with musical training. Walt Boyer, the music teacher at the Atwater School, whose video of the scale illusion was shown earlier, played the speech-to-song illusion to his class of fifth graders and videotaped their responses. Here's the result. Good morning, Mr. Who? Boyer. That's right. Would you all wave and say hello, Professor Deutsch? Uh, Professor Deutsch, I just explained to this class what I think might happen by listening to the next example, but I haven't told them or we haven't, they haven't heard any examples yet. So just to give you a little background as you're watching this uh, video or DVD, I'm, I'm going to try to make it into a DVD for her. Uh, they've never heard the example. I feel like I'm a magician. You've never met me before, have you? you know? uh, so let's see if you can hear what I think you're going to hear, you guys. <clears throat> The sounds as they appear to you are not only different from those that are really present, but they sometimes behave so strangely as to seem quite impossible. But they sometimes behave so strangely, they sometimes behave so strangely, sometimes behave so strangely. Try it. Sometimes behave so strangely. Go ahead. Sometimes behave so strangely. 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 So strangely. So strangely. So strangely. So strangely. So did you hear the melody? Yeah. So strange. Was she ever really singing though? No. So why do you think it happened? In a formal experiment, together with Trevor Henthorn and Rachel Lapidus, we recruited 11 subjects who'd had experience with singing in choirs or choruses, though none of them were professional musicians. We tested them individually and had them listen to the full sentence followed by the phrase repeated 10 times. And we asked them to repeat back the phrase exactly as they'd heard it. Here are the productions of six of the subjects played in sequence. And remember, they were repeating my spoken phrase. Sometimes behave so strangely. 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 Now here are the productions of all 11 subjects played as a chorus. Again, they were repeating my spoken phrase and they were tested in isolation with their recordings later mixed together. Sometimes it is so strangely. But you might then wonder whether these subjects could have heard the phrase as sung the first time they heard it anyway. So to check into this, we recruited another set of 11 subjects on the same basis. We also tested them individually and in isolation from each other. And this time we played them the full sentence, followed by the phrase played only once, and we asked them to repeat back the phrase exactly as they heard it. Here are the productions of six of these subjects played in sequence. Sometimes behave so strangely. 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 And here are the productions of all 11 subjects played as a chorus. Sometimes behave so strangely. And then, to make sure that these subjects were able to repeat back the pitches after a single hearing, we had them listen to the phrases sung only once, and again we asked them to repeat back what they'd heard. 
Here are the productions of the same six subjects as you just heard, and you can hear that they reproduce the sung melody very well. Sometimes behave so strangely. 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 So it's evident that when the phrase is heard only once, it's indeed perceived as speech rather than song. But when the phrase is presented repeatedly, it comes to be heard as song instead. The precise reason for this strange effect is unclear, but it does show that it's possible to cross over the perceptual boundary between speech and song without changing the physical parameters of the sound in any way. So what can be going on? I assume that when a phrase is presented, the information first travels up the auditory system and arrives at a central executive in the brain which determines, based on a number of factors, whether the sound consists of speech or song or something else. Physical cues must here play an important role. Speech consists of pitch glides that are often steep and of rapid changes in loudness and timbre. In contrast, song consists largely of well-defined musical notes and so of more stable pitches. But in this illusion, the percept changes from speech to song without any change in the stimulus features. Now, repetition occurs very frequently in music, but rarely in conversational speech. So repetition must be an important distinguishing cue. But I think that memory is also important here. The brain must contain a database of well-remembered pitch patterns and another database of well-remembered rhythms, and we recognize the songs by accessing these databases. Let's suppose, then, that the brain circuitry underlying memory for melodies recognizes the pitch pattern in a musical phrase, and the brain circuitry underlying rhythm recognizes the rhythm. As a result, the brain mechanisms responsible for analyzing this pattern as song are invoked, and the brain tweaks the percept so as to be in accordance with our memories. So to conclude, when an orchestra performs a symphony, where is the real music? Is it in the mind of the composer when he first imagined the piece, or in the mind of the conductor after he has gone over it many times and in the process changed his perceptions, or in the mind of someone in the audience, or of someone else in the audience? The answer is surely that there is no one real version of the music, but many, each one shaped by the particular brain organization of the listener and the knowledge and expectations that listeners bring to their experiences. Thank you. And a big thanks to Trevor Henthorne, Kevin Dooley and Rachel Lapidus for their collaborations.